our sisters, our daughters, modesty is a tool that communicates some really important things to the world. N namely, that among the society of Jesus, among our people, we're not in competition over gender. The way that we live in the world is communicating that this isn't an issue for us. We've settled on an order. God has helped us and given us an order that we fall into and the things that the world is constantly competing over, who's in charge, who's on top, who's doing this, who's doing that, that we have mechanisms and recourses to resolve that that don't end in competition. What, what it looks like in the Christian home to, to work out what it means to be a man or a husband, what it means to be a woman or a wife, has a resolution. And the resolution is that we work in conjunction and collaboration and cooperation, not in competition. We're not striving against each other to figure out, to use the colloquial expression, who wears the pants. I want to take a kind of a principled approach. I want to start from very big and, and focus in on, on some practical issues. But the question, uh, it begs the question, why, why should we talk about this? Why should we frame a message about women and modesty? And the, the short answer is because it's a biblical issue, because the scriptures talk about women and modesty. And so as a desire to be faithful people, as a desire to, to put things in their proper context, to talk a lot about the things that the gospel talks a lot about and talk occasionally about the things that, that the scriptures occasionally talk about, we want to come around to this subject. Um, I'm going to focus uh, pr there, this concept of women's modesties comes up twice in the New Testament. Um, and clothing in particular comes up a few other times in the Bible. But I, before we get even to those texts, I want to talk about what we don't believe. I, you know, having spent the time that I've spent in, in conservative Christian circles, there's, there's, this issue is approached sometimes from ways that make me very uncomfortable. Sometimes the idea is presented that women are like china dolls and they have to have a little curio cabinet to be kept in and their costume and the way that they're approached by the church is to take care of these delicate little things and make sure that nothing ruffles their feathers. This is a very Victorian idea. The idea, you know, back, I'm, I've been studying on costume lately. I've been thinking a lot about this issue and been having conversations about it. And this very much was a Victorian and post-Victorian idea. If you see pictures of the hoop skirts and the bustles, this idea that a woman was a caricature. She was she was this frail, faint little thing. And, and even in Victorian times, the fashion for women was to be waifish, was to be sickly and pale. And it was a sign of, of, of wealth. And uh, I've been reading about um, letters and commentary on Victorian fashion. And, and from some of the commentators back then, women would get together and have tea and talk about how sickly and weak they were and how they were having heart palpitations and how they couldn't get out of bed. And this was high society and high fashion. This was the, the, the thing that, to do for, for fashion and culture. And, and there's a lot of ideas and attitudes that went along with that. And those are not, those are not biblical ideas. Those are not scriptural notions. So I want to make sure that we're not trying to, we're not communicating that. I want to make sure that we're not communicating um, a view of women that has them as second class citizens, that they're somehow lower or diminished in their use or in their skills or in their gifts, that they, they occupy a position that's inferior to men. And I've heard these issues discussed um, from a perspective of 
of women being treated that way, and I, I don't like that. Uh, as if the as if the only measure of a woman was how clean her baseboards were or how many children she could produce. Those are those are not right ideas. I want to dispel the notion that the primary reason the church talks about or focuses on modesty for women is to protect men from lust. I don't believe that's a scriptural idea or position. I think men are responsible for lust. Uh, I think that, that, that men living holy lives should be equipped in whatever culture and whatever society they live in, no matter how many how much nude statuary and bathhouse are in the public square that Christian men are possessors of their own selves, that they have within Christ the grace and, and the holiness to keep themselves unspotted from the world. That's not women's job to make sure that men aren't lustful. It is women's job to make sure that they're honoring their creator, that they're, that they're showing the proper... Um, the proper attitudes towards God and his desire for them. And that's a different consideration. And when those things get crossed up, I think it makes, it, it does funny things. It makes women ashamed of things that they shouldn't be ashamed of. It, it makes um, men <coughs> emboldened and like it's not their job to fix their problems. There's a whole category of issues that goes wrong when that's out of its proper balance. Uh, you know, yeah, that's enough for that. The, the next thing I want to discuss is the question of, of whether or not the church is patriarchal. It's a, it's a controversial word. And it means different things depending on who's defining it. But, but is, uh, to what degree, or is the church a patri patriarchal structure? Are, are, are men in the place where they're responsible for, for leadership and direction. That's one way to, to, to diagnose patriarchy. Are men, um, well, in, in social and economic circles, does, do names pass through men? Do men control the family? Do men control inheritance? Those are socioeconomic versions of patriarchy. My answer to the question, in short, is that yes, there is there there are patriarchal notions within within the scriptures, and the reason I bring this up in in connection with all this is because I think that the way the way that the scriptures talk about modesty and the directions that they give us um, don't make sense if you don't put the whole picture together of why it should be the way it is. So so. In regards to that, like leadership structures of the church, how the how the how the church and society are supposed to work in God's ideals, there's some there's some observations I want to make. First is that God adopts masculine features and terminologies for himself. He presents himself as a father, he talks about himself in the masculine. The idea is presented at least anthropomorphically when God talks to men like a man. He uses the masculine for himself. He presents himself in that, in that guise. The, the one exception would be um, the creative power. A lot of people in Psalms, a lot of people attribute to Jesus, a, a personification or description of Jesus is in the feminine. But almost exclusively, everything that talks about God talks about him from a masculine perspective. The scriptures, so that's one. The scriptures prescribe gender definition and roles. There's, this is uh, assumed in certain categories, he, like for instance in Matthew 19 when, when Jesus says he created them male and female, like there's definite borders around those genders and what they're, how, how they are in the world and what they are in the world. Uh, and then, you know, when we talk about church administration and family administration, there's these things are defined again about who fits in which category and how they should function. When we look at that, we see that men are prescribed by the scriptures to be the heads of home and, and the leaders of the church. So they're supposed to be leading their homes and they're supposed to be leading their church. Um, and then here's an important issue, I think, if we're going to talk about 
about women's roles generally and, and modesty in particular is that from, from when we look at the epistles, when we look at, at, at Paul's writings in particular, the ideas of the origin and the fall are, are, they have current manifestations. They have current applications. So the fact that, like for instance, that, that Adam was the first creation and that Eve was made for Adam. The fact that Eve was the one that, that was deceived in the fall and Adam chose in the fall. These things have ongoing ramifications for men at large and women at large. They're still impactful to who and what we are as people. Those things uh, still have bearing on our lives and they're, they're discussed in that, in that way. It's, it's also worth noting, if we're going to talk that way about, about the ramifications of the fall and, and leadership and patriarchy and all those things, what the, what the Christian version of those things should look like. Whenever I, whenever I discuss these issues about, about women in particular, it's, it's having in full view my own daughters and their future families, my wife, uh, when we talk about these things, we need to make them very, very tangibly about our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, because I feel like that helps us not depersonalize these things. Like if I'm talking about leadership, how do I want my daughters to be led by their husbands? How would I want my mother treated? How do I want my sister to be treated in regards to leadership? That, should, that helps kind of like set right boundaries around these things and understand and diagnose where things are out of order. Would I want my sister treated like that? Would I want my daughter treated like that? Would I want my, my mother treated like that? Those are all appropriate questions to ask in regards to leadership. And when we do an examination of what Christian leadership should look like, it's beautiful to me that in Corinthians that Paul sets these orders in nested relationships. That what it should mean for my wife to be under my leadership, under my headship, should be like what it is for me to be under Christ's leadership. And that is like what it is for Christ to be under the Father's leadership. That this headship order are nested relationships and they should look like each other. The way that it plays out between a husband and a wife for him to be the leader of his home ought to be the way it plays out for Jesus to be the leader of mankind and ought to be like the way it is for the father to be the leader of his son, Christ. So the ideas of, of coercion, compulsion, um, violence, God forbid violence, uh, manipulation, none of those things fit within the Christian paradigm of leadership and headship. None of them fit within what the church should be doing in our homes and in our assemblies. None of those things that the world does in regard Gentile leadership and as far as lording over and forcing and manipulating and hurting, none of those things should be included in what we mean when we talk about the extents to which the church and Christianity in general is patriarchal. It should, what that should look like to us is what it looks like for Christ to lead all of us and for the Father to lead Christ. So that's my, that's my, my warning from the beginning. Let's begin in Genesis chapter 3. I better get a clock on myself. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to look at the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, starting in verse 7, this is just after. I want to highlight a few things out of this chapter. Um, this is just after Eve and Adam and Eve partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in verse seven, it says, and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Okay, so the, the, the awakening of, of moral conscience, the, the knowledge of good and evil, includes this shame of nakedness, this self-awareness, 
this understanding of self. For those of us that are parents, you watch this happen with children. There's a moral awakening that happens by degrees, but there's a place, it varies from child to child, but there's something that happens with a little baby who will run around in a diaper or naked and care nothing for it. And they don't even think that it, it's literally not on their mind. To, a, to an older child who apprehends, who understands, I'm naked, I can't be naked. Like that dawning happens and happened here in the garden. And it has an, ine an, an immediate response by Adam and Eve. They make themselves aprons uh, or loincloths is a good way to look at it. They were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. <clears throat> okay, so that's the initial response to their moral awakening. Is, is to cover, to have shame of, about, and to cover themselves, to cover their nakedness. Then it goes on, uh, they hide from God, that, that goes all along with the shame narrative. And then if we follow through the curse, they have this blame game with God. It was, no, it's this woman you gave me, no, it's the snake that tricked me. We come to verse 16. It's time about all the, all the curse that comes from this act of disobedience and says in verse 16, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. And then he, he curses Adam, he curses the ground. You have to work now by the sweat of your brow to eat your bread, all those things. My point in, in, in highlighting this is that it's a function of the curse. Now, one wonders, there's so many things. Like, that's such a small expression, that desire should be the husband. Like, there's so little bit of a data point there. Something monumental, something cataclysmic happens in the relationship between Adam and Eve. Something is now that wasn't before the fall. What was, what was the relationship between Adam and Eve before the fall? How did that function? And what materially changes before and after? We don't know. But something about this event alters human society. It alters human society the way that the world, the creation is altered, the way that the ground is cursed and from this point forward groans for the, the redemption. There's something in human society, in our relationships between man and woman that's altered from this point forward. And, and again, I have as many questions as I would dare to answer about that, but there's something permanent in this fissure. There's something about this that happens that changes Eve in relation to her, to her husband. And it's durable. Um, and then the last point is that it's as durable as, as pain and childbearing or having to work to eat. The last point I would have is in, in, in verse 21. Uh, is it 21? Yeah. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, this is interesting to me because the, the desire that they had to conceal themselves, God says that doesn't work. It's not sufficient. It's not enough. And, and, I, th I think it's, it's reasonable to, to view this event as the first sacrificial event because it's, it's twofold, right? It's the cost of something for a person's transgression. So it's a sacrifice in that sense, but it's also provision from God to cover over something. So in both of these senses, it's a sacrificial event. So we can say that the very first sacrifice is clothing Adam and Eve. And, and this word is a generic word about tunics, but it's for sure more comprehensive than what they did with just covering themselves. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe it's about durability. Maybe it's about longevity. Maybe it's about amount of surface exposed. I don't know what it is, but the fact is their initial impulse to cover themselves is insufficient. God says, no, here, this is what you need to do. Okay, so that's a grounding principle, I think, for, 
if we're going to talk about modesty, and we'll get to what that means in the New Testament, we'll look at some of that. But if we're going to talk about it, this is like the initial human experience with nakedness and covering it up. Okay, so let's go from here to 1 Timothy. We'll start there in the New Testament. Um, should we do that? Yes, let's do that. In 1 Timothy, um, in verse, let's start in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and let's start in verse 8. And what it says there is that, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also. Well, that's interesting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. What's similar about men praying, lifting hands, and women adorning themselves in modest apparel? I think, I'm going to speculate, I think these things are both vocational. They're about what we are supposed to be and be doing in the world. And men are supposed to be, in, in this passage at least, men are supposed to be presenting themselves as a, a, a priestly class. They're supposed to be demonstrating that they're not afraid of God, that they're connected to him, that they can approach him. And that's what this lifting of clean hands is about. This unhindered approach between man and God. Here we are. Something like that vocation is what is communicated in women adorning themselves in modest apparel. So it's not just about it's not just about concealment like the garden, it's not just about order and arrangement, it's about vocation. It's about presenting to the world who and what we are and why. So in regards to this vocation, it says that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. This word modest most of you probably know is cosmu or cosmios in, in the adjectival version of modest apparel. Catastola just means garments or flowing garments. <clears throat> and then it goes on to say, so that, that, that's a vocational calling for women to adorn themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness, this is a, this is, mm, I don't know what the, what newer translations would say, but but the root word is, is having a sense of shame. Um, yeah, it's actually some, uh, one of the translations looked at called it modestly. And sobriety, that's self-control, and then gives these very, very practical borders of definition. Now, I've had, I've had many conversations about about what women's modesty should look like. And, and very often, I think oftentimes in, in reaction to uh, overreach and excess, what people will say to me is that, Matthew, it's not all about clothes or covering. It's modest applies to the whole life. Modest means not excessive. And so it doesn't even really, like clothes are the least important part of this passage. It doesn't really matter how she dresses as long as it's, it's not excessive. What I would say is that the, the introduction to this and the conclusion is all about the way that a woman appears in the world, the way literally she looks. And these, these borders that, that Paul gives in, in, to Timothy here are very specifically about physical appearance in the world. And so I think it's more than reasonable to apply this expression of modest apparel to the way that a woman looks in the world. And, and those definitions are not with braided hair. These are very simple terms. It just means not with twisted hair twisted together. Not with gold. It, it doesn't say, it, it, this isn't the word for jewelry. It's just gold, like a gold coin would be this word. Don't have gold on you. Don't have pearls don't have expensive clothes. So here we develop some parameters for what this cosmo would look like. The, these help us understand what Paul's getting at with this admonition. 
it's it's not finery it's not luxurious so there's a kind of utility and simplicity that he's expecting that modest apparel looks like that's an important distinction i think utility and simplicity and um it's self-aware the shamefacedness and sobriety couches all this in some kind of self-awareness like i know how i'm I'm presenting myself to the world. I'm conscious of what I'm doing with the way that I appear. Um, <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, not with all those things, but which, which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now here's interesting where this goes from here. Right after this, he goes into, let the women line, learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Um, sorry. To be in silence, for Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Notwithstanding, she should be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity. And holiness with sobriety. That's the same as that word uh, about apparel there, sobriety. Well, this is interesting that all these ideas are connected. So we start with this vocational application. Here's what we should be and how we should be in the world as women. And then there's some definite borders around what, what we're after here. These kind of like self-awareness and, and, and utility as opposed to luxury. And then... And then it's all connected to a woman's place with, with, with the church in her home and why that should be. And all of that goes back to the garden. So there's a line of continuity between a woman's vocation, the application of what that looks like, and how it affects her behavior and place in the home, the church, and the world. All of these ideas are connected in one big ball here. So we have dress, attitude, disposition, and they're all connected to, to where we're coming from as a people. Okay, let's move on to 1 Peter. So, so far we have a principle in, in Genesis that says the awareness, the self-awareness of, of being naked is a moral awakening. There's an ineffective attempt to remedy that, which is corrected by the first sacrificial act where God provides something that's more comprehensive. Then now we jump to the New Testament and this is about vocation and who women are in the world and how they how they're modeling what God wants them to be. That has to do with how they appear, their their self-awareness of how they're presenting themselves to the world. And then it's caged in these terms of um, simplicity or utility at least. Okay, now let's jump forward to first Peter. In the third chapter, we start off in almost the same place. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands. So we ended with this idea of what the order looks like with, with the Eve and Adam thing from the garden and learning in subjection. That's how we end in Timothy, and it's where we start here in, Titus, in Peter. Peter. Uh, he says, likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation, the way of life of the wives, while they behold your chaste way of life coupled with fear. Whose adorning, same word, cosmos, let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of hair, just like Timothy, and of wearing of gold, just like Timothy, and of putting on apparel. Now here, there's, some, there's a different vernacular. What Peter is saying is a different set of words than what Paul was saying in Timothy. Here in Peter, these are ornamental things. So when he talks about the plating of the hair, this is like this word for very elaborate hairdos with like uh, oftentimes Greek women would have jewels braided into their hair. It's all very ornate. This word uh, without gold, wearing of gold, this is a word about jewelry, it's, it's ornate metal, gold work, precious metal work. And the putting on of apparel is again another kind of elaborate word. 
Um, and then he goes on to say, not with these things, whose adorning, whose cosmos, let it not be these outward things, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And then he talks about these obedient women from the Old Testament who had these great impacts. Um, what happens, what I, what I encounter quite often in this discussion with people is that people will look at these passages in Peter and they'll say, when, when we talk about wedding rings, for instance, they'll say, well, well, the scriptures don't say we can't wear a ring like a simple wedding band, it just means we can't wear really fancy, expensive jewelry. And, and that's a reasonable conclusion to draw from Peter because he's using these terms of elaboration, but it ignores what's happening in Timothy. And there's very simple, like, uh, don't, don't wear gold, period. Whereas Peter's saying, don't wear fancy jewelry. Well, the two need to go in conjunction just because... Peter says, don't wear fancy jewelry. It doesn't mean you can wear plain jewelry because Paul's addressing that in Timothy. So that's an important distinction to make. Um, I think it's worth, worth noting. Let me say another thing about that since we're on that subject. Um, the appeal to the wedding band is an interesting one. Uh, it's often used as an exception to these principles because there's... There's an appeal to some kind of like moral justification that the wedding band is about is about chastity or commitment or the oath or the vow or whatever the case may be. It's uh, it, 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 for for many couples, especially who've used who are used to wearing it for a long time since, you know, they got married with a wedding ring. Um, you know, their, 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 their marriage ceremony had some little discourse about the ring and it's like love and it's never ending. It has no beginning and no end. And like, there's a lot of ideology built up in, in the wedding band. And so when people encounter this and they encounter the church, it's a, it's hard for some people. Um, and there's, there's often an appeal to this passage. And what, what, I, what I like to share with people that, that are struggling with that is that what Peter's actually stating in this passage is that our identities, things like chastity, things like integrity, things like our virtue, are his whole point and the reason he uses those terms is because those virtues are not supposed to be bound up in these external appearance things. Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. Let's, let's flip there real quick. Ah, I don't even know if it's worth flipping there. You probably know what, I'm, what it is. It says, basically, it's a very simple, short verse. Here's what's interesting about that simple, short verse. It's in, a, it's in the context of, of how people should treat the people around them. Not just the people around them, the world around them. This passage, Deuteronomy 22, starts off with taking care of your neighbor's animals. Like if you're in Deuteronomy, if you're just relaxing at home and you look out your window and your neighbor's ox is tearing through the field, God's saying it's your job to help your neighbor and not let his ox get lost. You have a responsibility. It's not, it wasn't your problem before you saw it. It's not your fault that the ox is out. But because you love your neighbor, because he's your brother, you need to help him. So if he's in that kind of distress where his animal's gotten away and he doesn't know about it, it's your job to fix it. You're obligated to your neighbor's good. Then it goes on to right after that, that passage about my responsibility to help my neighbor, it says that it's, an, it's not right for women to wear that which pertains to a man or for a man to wear that which pertains to a woman. Anybody that does this thing is an abomination in land. And then it goes to caring for the created world around you, like being kind to animals, a nest of birds. It goes on from there. So this is all about the way we care for other people. And the, it's, a, it's kind of a funny injunction. Like you could take that passage out about dressing, men dressing in women's clothes or women dressing in men's. You could take that out and there would be a perfect continuity because it'd be go from taking care of your neighbor's ox if it gets out to not disturbing a bird's nest if you come across it. 
Like that's, those things fit in a natural harmony. And right in the middle of that is this passage about not wearing uh, clothing that doesn't belong to your gender. There's all kinds of questions you could ask about this. What does, what does gendered clothing look like in, in a culture that only wears robes? What's the difference between a man's robe and a woman's robe? So let's go back to whatever, four or 5,000 BC and talk about everybody's wearing robes. How do you tell a man's robe from a woman's robe? What are these distinctions? And, and there's, there's scant little about it. We don't, we don't exactly know. Some advocate that it's um, maybe wearing a weapon pertains to a man. Maybe, maybe certain ornamental things pertain to a woman. Uh, it's all speculative. But there's something at the core that Jesus is getting at, that to care for the world around you, you're purposefully staying within the boundaries of who and what you are. That you belong as a man, recognizable as a man. You belong as a woman, as recognizable as a woman. I have my own pet idea about this. I I personally think, I did another review of did this years ago, I think one of the distinctives, it may not be comprehensive, but one of the distinctives of, of masculine, and gender, masculine and feminine costume is the, the act of girding your loins. Uh, I, I just, before I came over here, I was just reading through again all the passages that, that talk about girding your loins. And if you don't know what that means, you know, if you have a robe on and you take the, you pull the back of your robe and you pull it up and you basically make pants, tuck it into your waist, into a belt. There's a few times that that happens. You do it if you're going to get in a fight for military purposes. You would gird your loins. So this expression of masculinity is attached to this idea of girding your loins because that's how a soldier would appeal, appear on a battlefield. You can't like run in a skirt on a battlefield. That wouldn't work very well. The other time is that literally to run, Gehazi, Elisha, they gird their loins to run, which is another, in the old world, a masculine pursuit. And, and to work, maybe you could connect some work ideas with girding the loins. There's a couple, there's two instances where, where girding, that word in English is used about girding sackcloth on a woman, but it has to do, it doesn't have to do with the it doesn't have to do with the activity of what you're doing while you're having girded loins. It doesn't have to do with fighting or running or any of those traits. It has to do with an expression of mourning. It means put sackcloth on you. So, so my speculation is that in, in the old world, it would have been inappropriate to see a woman with girded loins. There's another like circumstantial case to be made about that. Um, when there's some there's a curse i think it's in isaiah i don't remember if it's isaiah or Jim, jeremiah but it says that I'll, I'll expose he's he's cursing the nation he says i'll expose your thigh as a woman at the grinding mill and so and there's a, there's actually a couple instances of this where women who would grind at a mill they they didn't gird their loins they would hike up their skirt it was a very intimate place where you would only do that around family you do it in the courtyard when mama's out preparing the food she would hike up her skirt and sit down at a grinding stone and be exposed and it's that exposure that the the prophet is cursing i'm going to expose you like a woman at the mill a place that a woman would never want to be seen a place where she should be protected and from from prying eyes so this idea uh, about these manifestations of costume seem to be at least in my mind connected to what these masculine and feminine presentations of costume are i i don't i don't want to make too much of that and maybe somebody has other good ideas about it i'd be, I'd be happy to hear uh just for reference job 40 verse 7 says gird up thy loins like a man that expression is used a few times but it seems to be like there's an intrinsic connection between that which is masculine and and this act of girding. So I want to move from here. Uh, those are kind of the primary scriptures that we look at in regards to appearance and costume. And I want to say, what, what, is, this, what is this idea from these apostolic admonitions? What is cosmu? What is modest? Modest. 
And how do we how do we understand what God wants out of all of us in regards to these things? And 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 when I consider that, what I would where I would begin is I would say we have to we have to recognize that what it means to be um, what it means to have the gift of language is that there's a compromise at play in any language. So if I'm going to say something in order for us to exchange ideas, in order for me to take a thought out of my head and turn it into sound waves and put it in your ears and it to mean something, it has to mean something in common. This is just the inherent reality of language. So if I say this wall is yellow, I'm making all kinds of assumptions about all of you that you understand that this is a wall and we both agree to that at least in, enough to have a conversation about it and that yellow is a thing and that this applies to it and that this doesn't by way of contrast. So when we look at something in the scriptures that's prescriptive that says you should do this there has to be some kind of common exchange. Another, a, 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 place, to, a place to consider this is, is um, one where often people have this conversation as well. What does it mean to, for a woman to cover her head? Like, what fits within that category and what does not fit within that category? So when, when we talk about these things, oftentimes people will, will say to me, well, Matthew, followers away, doesn't believe in extra biblical standards. So if you're going to make some kind of definitions around what it means for a woman to be modest, aren't you making an extra biblical standard? And I would say that, that there, there is certainly some gray area involved, but we make a distinction between that which is derived from the scriptures. Like, here's a word in the scriptures telling us to do it. Now let's have a conversation about what that means is not an extra biblical standard. Whereas something that we're, we're not connecting directly to the scriptures and talking about the definitions and parameters is a different category of thing. And I think that's an important distinction to make. The lack of specificity, because you have to leave, if we're saying we're talking about the, the parameters, we're talking about the definitions, we're talking about the borders, that's a different conversation. Because you recognize there's some like, we're just applying some metrics, we're applying some logic, we're applying some room for concord and agreement so that it can be meaningful. <clears throat> so that's, that's, that's one important, I think, point. If, 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 imagine, do this thought experiment. Imagine that in these passages, Peter and Paul had written, instead of a woman should dress in modest apparel, Imagine that they had said she should dress in blue apparel. It'd be weird, but just for the sake of thought, the apostle says Christian women should wear blue apparel. Well, you can imagine how those conversations would go in different circles. You know, how blue is blue? Well, is it's not red. Can we at least agree on that? Well, maybe. But how blue does it have to be to be blue? How, how blue is blue? What about green? Because blue and yellow make green. So if we wear green, aren't we kind of wearing blue? Like all that you can imagine all that would fall out of that conversation. And I think that if, if that were the case, what I would say is like, well, let's start with what we know is blue and work from there. Like, let's all agree on blue. Something is blue. What is it? And I think that's a helpful approach. <clears throat> I, when I think about this issue, what I want to teach about this issue is that our sisters, our daughters, modesty is a tool that communicates some really important things to the world. N namely that among the society of Jesus, among our people, we're not in competition over gender. Like, especially now, especially today, 
when, when you listen to what's happening in, in, in pop culture and cultural discourse, if you listen, like especially right now, where both, both parents are used to working out of the home and now everybody's been back home and now who's responsible for the children and the negotiations between what, who works when, who takes care of children when, who does what, where, like this is a big issue right now. And I think that when, the, way that, the way that we live in the world is communicating that this isn't an issue for us. We've settled on an order. God has helped us and given us an order that we fall into. And the things that the world is constantly competing over, who's in charge, who's on top, who's doing this, who's doing that, that we have mechanisms and recourses to resolve that that don't end in competition. That, that what, what it looks like in the Christian home to, to work out what it means to be a man or a husband, what it means to be a woman or a wife, has a resolution. And the resolution is that we work in conjunction and collaboration and cooperation, not in competition. We're not striving against each other to figure out, to use the colloquial expression, who wears the pants. It's not, it's not something we have to constantly be butting heads about. It's resolved. We know how to do that. And I, I'm not trying to make claims that we're blissful creatures that never have any confrontations in our homes about those things. But, but there's a pattern at work. And there's something to go back to. There's something to rest in. There's something to set our sights on and to, to live through, to be to be in order as men, as women, and for that distinction to be clear is a really important thing to communicate to the world. So I think that's some of why it matters. Um, so, so let's talk, let, let's talk about the specifics. I think when we, when we talked about this, one of the things that I was supposed to specifically answer is, what about women's, women's dress and, and should women wear dresses as opposed to pants? <clears throat> and, and my answer is yes. And there's, a, there's several reasons why. It's certainly true that, um, that costume is bound up in culture. Like people groups wear costumes to different for different reasons. So so one thing may mean something here and it means something else on the other side of the world or at a different time. There's certainly variation in what a culture is communicating by the way that they dress in regards to their gender, in regards to their status, in regard to their wealth, in regards to their occupation. There's all kinds of things that we communicate with our clothing. Since the garden, we've been inventing all kinds of different ways to communicate who and what we are and where we come from and what we do with the way that we dress. And those are variable. So if culture is bound up in costume, if the two things kind of go together, if they're intertwined, what does that mean for us? What do we, how do we want to use that? And what does it mean for us as God's people? All that to say, it's worth examining our culture a little bit. If you ask me, Matthew, what does... What does it, if you were going to start a church in rural China, how, how would you teach on this? I don't know. I don't know. I, I haven't been there. I don't know what costume means in that culture. I don't know what the, I don't know a lot of things that I would have to understand or appreciate to be able to make a connection between what Paul and Peter are teaching here and how to apply that to the church there. It, it, it could vary. There's certainly variations that would apply. What does it mean here is a worthwhile question. I would begin that examination by saying that femininity, 
is still expressed in the culture at large in with dresses and skirts now it's it's not exclusively expressed that way but it's certainly expressed that way what i mean by that is this it is still the case that if a woman wants to display her femininity she puts on a dress if she's going to a wedding if she's going out to dinner if she's going to a formal event women still wear dresses that's a display of femininity and when that matters when that's an important part of what needs to be communicated like a date like a formal event like a wedding whatever the case may be women wear dresses this tells me that there's there's still an accepted expression of our culture that femininity is bound up with dresses and the converse is also true that a man if he were to don a dress or a skirt in our culture is expressing something countercultural counterintuitive and across his gender that leaves dresses and skirts that flowing form of costume the domain of femininity in western culture that appropriation now in the in the in the the gender dysphoria and transgender community where a man adopts the the trappings of a woman this is how he does it he puts on these feminine effects namely dresses and skirts that tells us that there's still a feminine archetype in costume in our culture given that our culture is falling off the cliff in regards to gender distinction and how important of a looming issue that is for God's people in this country and culture, it's all the more important that we as the people of God are making clear statements about femininity and masculinity. That just like, just like the communication to the world that we understand order, we understand God's intention, and we aren't in competition about these things, it's just as important for us to communicate there is a really clear line in the created order. There is a really manifest version of femininity and masculinity, and we adopt those things by the way that we dress and the way that we look. These are our... our cultural versions now how valid is that i i um i think about this issue a lot in terms of like what where, where does the church sit? i if how do i start that thought the church is flexible enough to be able to say different things at different times to the world around them within the universal patterns of the church so what I mean by that is that the faith is once delivered. There's principles, doctrines, and practices that are the church's domain from the apostolic age to the end of the age. There are certain things that are just Christian. Within that, there are manifestations and expressions. So from different, at different times and places, the church has needed to state some things more clearly than the other. A perfect example of this is the Arian controversy and the Nicene Creed. All the wordsmithing that gets done in the Nicene Creed and the discussions that are happening among Orthodox bishops versus Arian bishops about what does the created order look like? How is Christ and who is he and what is he? And the, the settling in the Nicene Creed of very God, of very God, like defining Christ as one with the Father was an important expression for the church in that world in that day. In order to hold on to the truth that the church was, she needed to communicate this particular truth to the world around her. And that's happened all over the time. Like, like um, the church's non-resistance in wartime. Like when you read Michael Sattler's defense of his position of non-resistance in regards to a raging war with the Turks in Europe, like that's an especially important point to make in that in that time. That maybe in another set of circumstances isn't as highly tiered. And so, so I think it's 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 reasonable for us to look at issues like our culture and say. Right here and right now, the world is falling apart in this way, and we need to have something to say to it. And because we need to have something to say to it, we're going to be, we're going to show an abundance of, of, of care and concern for this particular issue. 
And I would say that for us today, our care and concern over the issues of, of masculine and feminine are of the utmost importance to the world around us, not just for the maintenance of our own homes, but also for the message of what the church is in the world and how she can be a beacon and a guiding light to show people how we should be in the world, how we can overcome these errors and wrong ideas and, and, and brokenness of, 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 of what's happening in the world around us. So, so if costume is culturally manifest, what's happening in our culture that should inform our manifestation of costume? That's an, that, I think that's a, an important way to approach this issue, at least today and here. My last point about this issue, maybe my second to last, is that I think that history and origins matter. Let me reverse engineer this. When would, <clears throat> what's the span of time out in front of us as, as, as our culture's ideas around gender change? When will it be normal and acceptable for a man to come to meeting and address? Now there's a fringe element that's doing that now. When will that be normal? Will it ever be normal? What are the conditions that would create a world in which it was normal for a man to come and meet with us in a dress? That's an interesting thought experiment. When you look at that, when you ask that same question about a woman wearing pants, you don't even have to go that far back and look. Let me give you a brief history of women wearing pants in the West. In the end of the 19th century, uh, around the 1850s, there's a, <clears throat> there's a movement in Europe and in America for simplicity of dress. <clears throat> and it's a very reasonable and I think honorable movement, social movement. Um, the average Victorian woman is wearing somewhere between 18 and 23 pounds of clothing. Um, you know, whalebone hoop skirts and bustles. There's, there's a lot of damage being done to women's internal organs and body from bodices and, 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 and corsets. Um, there, there's women are getting run over in the streets by horses and carriages because their inability to move. They, they, they oftentimes need uh, an aid to help them move about through the streets. Um, there's a lot of really extreme ha things happening at the end of the Victorian era in regards to f women's dress. In fact, the bustle is kind of, uh, you know, you think the Old West bustle. Um, it's where it really becomes developed in, 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 in common use is the simplification of the hoop skirt, which was made a woman just look like a cone. It, it, it's really strange. And the bustle is just to put that out the back instead of all the way around her so she can move a little bit, presumably because the West needs a little, women need, are a little more active and need more movement. But all these things lead to some really sensible people, both men and women, who say, this is crazy. You can't do this to women. It's hurting women. And so there's a simplicity in dress movement. Now, that has varied success. Um, it, by the time the 20th century rolls around, the early 20th century, the, the simplic simplicity in dress movement finds sympathy with the women's suffrage movement and later the certain factions of the prohibition movement. All these issues kind of go in a bag together. It's interesting, it's really a fascinating history because the simplicity in dress gets abandoned because it's seen as too radical. For women who are advocating for voting and for prohibition, changing women's dress is too radical. <clears throat> 
and and it's only the most extreme advocates that that maintain it and if you if you get a chance go on google and look up the bloomer costume what most of these um what these most radical advocates of change in dress were bloomers which was a skirt to the at least the middle of the thigh and very large pants underneath that was too radical for most people there were some uh like utopian communities even here in the in new england that adopted this dress for women but they were known for being weirdos and radicals and polygamy and all kinds of strange things so all that became too toxic and the whole thing kind of gets ditched the next thing that happens is the second war is the next big epoch on on change in women's fashion all this time all these discussions are happening the idea of women not wearing dresses is talked about exactly like you and i would talk about a man wearing a dress it's inappropriate it's it's creating gender confusion it it's literally under the terms cross-dressing um the war is the next big the second war especially is the next big change in how the west is dealing with costume and what happens is as all the men go off to war and women are needed in manufacturing jobs especially in the manufacture of munitions um, women would go to a factory they would put on coveralls and they would do a shift in a factory whether it was for wages or for munitions or whatever the whatever they're doing because of the lack of men then they would go and change back into their street clothes and go about their day it it still was would not have been been seen as decent in any way for her to be seen outside of work in that situation in fact there's a famous case of um, some women who were flying planes around the U.S. that flew them from, they had a, a group of five women who would fly planes from one location to another in the U.S. for whatever reasons, just to ferry stuff around. <clears throat> and they would wear coverall flight suits. And they landed somewhere, I don't remember where, and they, instead of changing into dresses, they wore their flight suits and walked from the airbase to the local hotel where they were going to stay overnight and were arrested, all five of them, for indecent exposure. This is in the Second War era. <clears throat> so it was still considered indecent exposure for a woman to be seen in pants in public. But there's a lot of social fabric that gets changed in the Second War. That, that situation of, of so many men being gone and women filling the vacuum in the workforce and beginning to make their own wages for the first time creates a desire for economic independence, it gives a lot of women who were in bad situations, bad marriages, all kinds of things, a chance out. Like, I can make my own money. I can live my own life. And so a lot of women stay in the workforce, at least many more than had, and it made sense to continue that. Uh, social ideas begin to progress throughout the 50s and into the 60s, and then you have the sexual revolution where the ideas of gender begin, gender, monogamy, a lot of standard morals of, of American, the American West begin to be altered in almost irreparable ways. And this is kind of, this is kind of the breaking point when costume changes for women and it becomes much more acceptable for women to wear, wear pants in common culture. So we're talking about the 60s just 10, 15 years before I was born. That's how recently we're talking about this. Now, up until m most of, uh, m at least all my childhood, within Christian circles, anything that was seriously observing Protestant Christians, women would still generally wear dresses and certainly within, within church circles. So you can see this evolution of change, and you can see how something f from becoming cr called cross-dressing, where it would never fit within a woman's identity to wear pants, to now it's almost as common in public for women to wear pants as not, but s now flip the coin. Now, what, what does that look like? What does that progression look like for men wearing dresses and the reversal? Will it reverse? What does that look like? Is, what does the church think about that? How would we intervene? What statements would we be making? And 
why, where would we ground it and why would it matter? The answer to all those questions, we should look at retrospectively and say, does it apply here as well? It's the same issues, it's just behind us instead of in front of us. So all that to say, I think that, I think that making clear lines around our gender identity is worth any of the, any of the difficulty for people coming because all those things I just talked about are, are to gain. So that's, um, I think that's everything I have to say. I, I, I would like to, I'd love to hear from people. Um, I'd love for you all to be talking in your congregations about these ideas and issues and how much they matter and how to weigh them and how to apply them. Uh, and I think we'll close there. Let's, let's, say, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we, are, we are grateful for your leadership of our lives. We're grateful, Father, for the direction that you give us and, and how you show us who and what we should be in the world. Father, I want to bless you in Jesus' name for our sisters, the mothers among our people, the bearers of children, the nurturers, those that tend to their homes and, and raise them in the knowledge of Christ, our daughters, who look to us and, and um, desire to be found pleasing in your sight. Father, I pray that you would pour out your blessing on our women, all of them, that they would be full up, that they would be fulfilled in Christ, that they would have all the expression of individuality and value and identity that you have created them to have. I pray that their gifts and their skills and their value would be clear to all of us. I pray, Father, that you would have everything that you want to get out of all of us, and especially our women, that you would receive glory to yourself over and over again from their lives, from their willingness to, to be in line and in order with what you want for all of us, for our lives. For I pray that you bless their sons and daughters, that their example and their testimony and their way of life would sow seeds in them about the truth of God and the goodness of Jesus. We ask you to make us wise and help us to understand these things. Uh, help us to properly evaluate, to rightly divide the word of truth, to put things in their proper categories and know how to weigh and evaluate what matters to you. We ask for your grace on your people, upon your whole church. In Jesus' name, amen.